and in your Bibles. Revelation chapter number 9. I know that politics stuff gets kind of touchy, folks. It really does. And I, I thank God I'm an American. I thank God I got the freedom and the liberty to vote. And I think that's a great thing. I'm not trying to discourage you from voting or from, you know, pushing people to do the right thing and choose the lesser of two evils and all that stuff. But I'm just telling you, it shows you what a sad state we're in in this country when we got to pick between a you know, Mormon and, and God doesn't even know what the other one is. You know, I mean, uh, God only, I mean, I meant God only knows what the other one is. <laughs> he might be like, he's a nothing. I don't know. <laughs> But, you know, I mean, that's a sad thing when you can't even have a, a, a quasi-Christian to vote for. Isn't that sick? That's a sad thing. Revelation chapter number 9. You guys realize something? Just, just let me, I'm sorry. i got to get this off my chest. You guys realize something? One, one seems to just deny biblical Christianity completely. You got that? The other one was a Mormon. Now, remember... Remember what we've even been looking through through our Revelation series. How's the devil going to work? Hey, uh, haven't we seen the verses over and over again? His ministers, ministers of righteousness. Now watch. The front of the Book of Mormon. Another gospel of Jesus Christ. Which is not another. How's the, how's the Antichrist going to come? I am Christ. He doesn't say don't believe in Christ. He just says, yeah, I'm Christ. Just not the right Christ. So you realize God might have been doing us a favor more than we realize. Satan's not in the bars shooting heroin and, 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 and guzzling beers. And he's working in the churches, in the religions. So who knows what the Lord's doing, but thank God we can trust him and we'll be all right. Amen. Yeah. Revelation chapter 9. Let's get into something positive tonight. <laughs> How many of you have read nine? Have you read, read ahead and knew where we were at tonight? No? I got two heads shaking. Yes, that's great. By the way, it'll help you out since Sunday morning we're going through Corinthians and we'll be preaching, kind of teaching. And then uh, we're going to be doing, uh, starting this week, Romans in the afternoon service. And then we're going to be going through Revelation. So if you just read ahead and get familiar with it, uh, you know, it might help a little bit. So let's, let's get into this stuff. Revelation chapter 9, verse number 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when it striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto the horses prepared unto the, unto battle, and on their heads were as it were a, like uh, as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name is in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue his name is Apollyon. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, I love you, and I thank you so much for Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you that my king is going to come, he's going to rule, he's going to reign on this earth. With a rod of iron. And Father, I just, I, I feel strangely calm and strangely peaceful in my heart today. Lord, I just know that in the end we win. And between now and then, Father, I want to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Between now and then, Lord, I want to be found faithful. I want my heart to soften. I want my, uh, my uh, profiting to appear to all. I want to take heed unto myself and unto the doctrine. I want to take heed to the church that you've given me, Lord. I want wisdom from God to make the right choices, Father, and to 
Uh, Lord, prepare as we should. I, I just pray that you'd strengthen me and help me as a pastor. Lord, help me to learn to love people more every day. More importantly than that, help me to learn to love my Savior more. Help me to get a heart for lost souls, Lord. And I pray that, Lord, you'd come back soon. I mean, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We want you to come back, Lord. But I pray that when you come, you'd find me faithful. You'd find me watching and you'd find me working. You'd find me just right with you, Father, pleasing you. And I pray you'd find this church right where you want it, in the center of God's will, in the Word of God, praying, trying to lead souls to Christ, living a godly life, just doing all that we can, all that we're expected of, and then some, for our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, I love these people, and I thank you for sending them here tonight, every one of them, Lord. And I just pray, God, you'd help the Word of God to be a blessing to them. I know this is heavy stuff we're looking at tonight. and We don't ever want to get our eyes on, on wicked and evil things, but we're going through the Word of God and we know it's written for our good. So we pray that you'd help us as we get into this to have some balance, Lord, to look to Christ in it all and to be strengthened spiritually. Teach us the Word of God, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we saw last week that things are going to get worse. And I kind of ended last week just saying it's going to get worse for you and I as we get closer to the tribulation period. And I've made over and over again the point to you, and I I can't seem to make the point enough. I want to repeat it again, that it's almost like a like a birth. And I've mentioned that to you. And it's a funny thing as you read through the Bible and you see how the whole creation groaneth and travaileth together in pain until now. And and if you look at those verses and you study that thing out, this creation that Jesus Christ created longs for its Messiah, longs for its Creator. And the time is coming when Jesus Christ will come back. And as you get into the tribulation period here, what happens is the the earth is pregnant. And you we showed you the verse, and so I'll just quote it today. It says, "Shall shall a nation be born in a day?" And at the end of that tribulation period, what you've got is a nation being born in a day. That nation is Israel. I would love to find out what's been going on between America and Israel. I wish I knew. I wish I could somehow find out what kind of uh, moves we're making against her. And when some of the major storms have hit this country, I I, I read one guy's research, and I'm quoting it off the top of my head, so I'm not going to give you the guy or the facts, because I, I don't remember But I remember reading his research when he was tracking storms and major catastrophes that were happening in this nation and exactly what policies were going to pass in Washington, D.C., anti-Israel at the time. It's scary. And so it's all about that nation being born. It's about Jesus Christ, their king, coming back. And the earth is pregnant here. I mean, right now, she's she's right. She's just like right before labor. (laughs) She's in like, what do you ladies call it, the third trimester? It used to be like nine months or whatever, and now it's the trimester, whatever, however that thing works. But I mean, right now she's pregnant. And Jesus told us that you could see the signs of the times. We don't know the day, we don't know the hour, but we clearly can see the signs of the times. And if you can't see the signs of the times that Jesus Christ is coming, that the end times are very near, then you are blinder than a bat backing and backwards. I mean, you, you, you can't see nothing. Jesus Christ is about to come. And as the tribulation period progresses, those contractions get worse and worse. And I showed you that for the first three and a half years, every seven months, a major catastrophe hits. I mean, I'm talking massive numbers of deaths. And I ran the numbers with you about a couple months ago. On how many were dying in the first waves. Just unbelievable. The death toll. The famines and the pestilences and all these things that are going to be coming to pass in the tribulation period. But then we finished last week in verse 13 and he says, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. He went through chapter 8 and he showed us some horrifying things. I mean, waters turning into, into bitter waters that men die if they drink. And, and all these crazy things happening in chapter number 8. But then he says, wait a minute, it's going to get worse. And we start into chapter number 9 with things getting worse. Look at verse number 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven to the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Now, wait a minute. Pastor Chad covered it pretty well on Sunday afternoon, so I'm not going to spend the time, but, but you know number five is the number of death in the Bible, right? 
Funny, all the Bible scholars seem to think it's the number of grapes, but I, they, I don't find that. <laughs> it's the number of death. And what you've got here is the fifth angel in verse number one. Now look down with me at verse number five. Unto whom it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. All the way through the Bible, that number five is negative. And it's no coincidence that it lands in verse number five. Now, it's not the topic tonight, but the research has been done, and I could show you the numerology and the chapter and verse markings. You would have to say, no, I don't. I just simply deny the facts because I just don't believe that, and I don't want to believe that, to, to say that the chapter and verse markings don't have the hand of God all over it. This Bible you got right here is bigger than you and I can figure out. It's an amazing book. So in verse number five, he talks about the torment for five months. So what you got here is the judgment of God. What you got here is death. Look at verse number 10. And they had tails like unto scorpions and there were stings in their tails. And their power was to hurt men five months. You know what's going to be going on? That angel comes down, that star comes down with the key and he opens up the bottomless pit. And out of the bottomless pit comes some beasts. Come some evil beings. You guys watch any any movies or just say, uh, uh, you know what, that wouldn't be a fair question. Let's say it this way. Have you seen the previews for the movies? <laughs> right? Right, come on. <laughs> all kidding aside, really. We've all seen them, right? I'm raising my hand. This is me raising my hand. Yeah, okay, you've seen them. The crazy stuff they got going on. It's amazing what little kids can sit and watch in the cartoons nowadays. You know what that's It's all just prepping you for this. Because I showed you before that men are going to blaspheme and deny Jesus Christ all the way through this. How is it that as these things are erupting in your face, you don't fall to your knees and start saying, God Almighty, I remember that preaching, God Almighty, that's in the Bible. I'm going to repent. I'm going to find out what i got to do to be saved. I'm going to get this figured out. How can they continue to harden their hearts against all the catastrophes happening? Because the spirit of Antichrist is already working in the world, preparing them, and men's hearts are wicked. That's all there is to it. I hope if this economy fails, America repents. I really believe that all the Bible believers need to quit quoting First Chronicles. If my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. I think they need to quit playing that. Pray, quit quoting that prayer. God was talking to Israel. I think we need to quote, go ye therefore in all the nation, all the world, and preach the gospel of every creature. We need to be quoting the Great Commission. We got this thing off track. We got it all backwards, folks. Men's hearts are going to get harder. You got that? And if you study Bible prophecy, all this hope of a national or a worldwide revival is pretty much gone. Now, I can have one. And we can have one. And we can personally and individually be soul winners. What did I show you on Sunday morning? Doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Paul's books, right? As you get down towards the end, he has three books that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished. First and second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, two man. You know how God's working today? He's going to work individually. So if we as a collective group say we want to be God's people, God will show up. I want to be a soul winner. I can be a soul winner right to the trumpet. Ain't that cool? Nobody gets saved anymore. I want to go out right in the middle of saying, but, well, d- well, let's just do it right now. Well, bow your head and pray. Have that guy bow his head. Lord, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. There we go. Wouldn't that be a great way to show up in heaven? See, I'm not discouraged, folks, but I'm just telling you, I don't think we're seeing any nationwide revivals. I, I, I could be wrong, but I don't think so. I hear reports of, people, reports of guys getting saved all over, the, all over the country. And one guy said, well, maybe we're on the cusp of a, of a revival. I said... No, we're on the cusp of Jesus coming back. And he's just bringing in that last little bit of gleanings. I want to be a part of that. Amen. So men's hearts are going to get harder. And as they progress through the tribulation period, it's amazing that they don't repent, but they don't. They just get harder and harder and harder against the truth. So as the Lord opens up this bottom, as the star opens, this this angel opens up the bottomless pit, these beasts start coming out. Now check out these beasts. Look down with me at verse number 7. And the shape of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. So you got a locust in the shape of a horse. That's kind of odd. Try to put this together in your head. If I could draw, I'd draw this thing. Anybody that can draw, copy this and draw it for us. 
All right? And on, the, and on their heads were crowns like gold. It didn't say a crown of gold. It said crowns like gold. And their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings, so they got wings. As the sound of chariots of many horses run into battle. And then they have a tail like a scorpion where they can sting men with. You know what you've got coming out of there? You've got something coming out of hell that is crazier than anything any man's ever imagined in reality. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. They said, it's going to get worse. Now, I want to get into some things here, but before we do, I want to show you something. Go back with me to Matthew chapter 27. Let me say this. I want you all to please try to hear me on this, Okay. We're going to look at some stuff tonight, and I'm going to show you the best I see it. Okay? Did you hear that? I'm not going to say every single thing that I see, I know for sure that I'd be willing to bleed and die over, that I'm absolutely right. Okay? Because some of this stuff, I don't care who you are or who your teacher is, nobody knows absolutely for sure. And you're not going to know until the millennium, like I've already showed you, when Jesus Christ is going to sit down and teach you some Bible. Then we'll know. (laughs) And that's going to be a thousand year process of growth. We've seen that already. So what makes us think in the flesh as puny little men, even if you had the IQ of Einstein, that was 174, 175 or something like that. Even if you had Einstein's IQ, you could not confidently say you got it all. All right. But I'll show you what, what my best guesses are and my reasons for them scripturally. Look at Matthew 27, verse 50. We're looking at the issue of the bottomless pit here. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. What a, what a great verse stuck in the middle of Revelation 9. Isn't it great to get your mind off that stuff a little bit? I mean, that's just right there. That truly this was the Son of God. That did something inside of here for me just now. I don't know about you, but man, praise God we got the right one. Amen. Not good. Now watch. The graves are opened in verse 52. The bodies of the saints which are sleeping arise. Now, have you ever looked at Luke 16 and you see the great gulf fixed, right? And on one side is souls in hell and on the other side are souls in Abraham's bosom. Are you with me? Do you ever say, okay, I see that picture. Well, how does that fit in with the bottomless pit? The picture we have of hell now. It's a good thought. Is that not a fair thought to say, okay, well, the Bible says, shows this to us this way, but over here it says something different. Do you ever think? And then compare Scripture with Scripture? Very interesting, this earthquake in chapter 27. And the bodies are coming up. Those bodies that arise, where are they coming from? The graves. Where were their spirits? Abraham's bosom. You remember that now in the Old Testament They couldn't go to heaven. Christ hadn't died on the cross yet. So where did they go? They went to Abraham's bosom. And they waited for the Messiah to be crucified, to to go down, to preach the gospel to them, and to lead captivity captive, right? You remember all that. So those guys come up out of the grave. That spirit, that soul come up out of Abraham's bosom. They meet the body of those saints, and those saints arise when Christ does. And there's an earthquake going on right at that time. The veil of the temple is ripped, showing you that you have access to God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, Look at chapter 28. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. So you had an earthquake in chapter 27. But wait a minute. The bodies of the saints don't arise until after the resurrection. So something was happening in that first earthquake and that veil is rent. The second earthquake is a great earthquake. And it's after the resurrection. I'll show you what I think was happening. And, and you could, we could sit and argue all night long. Just 
Just so you know, I don't intend to at all. I'm just showing you what I think happened. Go back to Isaiah chapter 5. Excuse me, I'm about 99% better, but... <clears throat> now, now, I'm going to back up here for a second and I'm going to show you what's wrong with the country you're, you're in right now. First of all, verse number one, God plants a vineyard in a fruitful hill. Has that not been America? Have we not been fruitful? I mean really fruitful in a short period of time. The nations of the world hate our guts because we became what we became overnight compared to them and they've been around forever. Now move forward with me. Look at verse 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Now we know that doctrinally. You can apply this spiritually or practically to us. And the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry. Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place, that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. You know what you've got? Cities. You know what America's done? It's become industrialized. That was the Industrial Revolution. They went away from the foundation God gave them, the fruitfulness God gave them, the way God created things to be. And we've been in a long, slow, steady process of walking away from God. Now watch. In mine ears, saith the Lord of hosts, of a truth, many houses shall be desolate. Aren't we seeing that happen? We're already seeing it. Have you guys just done any research at all on Detroit and the urban farms and everything else going on down there? I think they said 30,000 empty businesses and 90,000 empty homes, something like that. How many of you realize that Henry Ford was a big anti-Semite? I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. Detroit's been leading the nation in in, in violent crimes, in drugs, in alcohol. and We led the nation into the recession. And we're doing the worst to everybody, really. Isn't that kind of scary how powerful this book in front of you is? Now watch. In mine ears, saith the Lord of hosts, of a truth, saith the Lord of hosts, of a truth, many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair without inhabitant. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath. And the seed of an homer shall yield an ephah. You know what they're saying about all this GMO stuff, right? All the way they're taking the DNA and they're, uh, they're, they're, they're manipulating the seed and they're saying you're going to be more fruitful. You're going to bring forth more product and healthier, more nutritious for the body. You know what the farmers are actually saying? Our yields are going down. And the nutrition levels in our seeds are going down. You can't play God, man. You just can't beat Him. Verse 11. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink. Have you ever done the research on how much liquor America drinks? How much liquor goes down the pipe there in New Orleans during the, what's that, what is that, uh, Mardi Gras? It's sickening how much liquor this nation consumes. Nowadays, if a preacher gets up and just preaches against liquor in your average fundamental church, he's going to have half his church mad at him. That continue until night, till wine, wine inflame them. And the harp and the vial and the tabard and the pipe and wine are in their feasts. It's just party, party, party. But they regard not the work of the Lord. Neither consider the operation of His hands. They don't even know how He works. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. People are more biblically ignorant today than they've ever been. And I'm talking about Christians, God's people. Just biblically, just biblically Retarded. I'm, I'm not trying to be rude. I, I just I can't think of a more fitting word. Just like really, <laughs> wow. I had one guy say to me when he heard I was going through a hard time and he called me to be a blessing and I appreciate him. I mean I do. I really appreciate him. He said, "Brother, that's the baptism of fire." I said, "Baptism? Of what am I? I didn't know I died and went to hell. <laughs> a baptism of fire is hell, folks. <laughs> People just don't get the Bible anymore. They don't understand. They got no knowledge." And their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Now watch. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. And their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. Now, I said all that. I wanted to show you that just to show you where your nation's at. But to make the point in verse 14, hell enlarged herself. Now, my opinion, what I think happened 
is you had a great gulf fix. You had Abraham's bosom. You had hell. When Christ died, there was an earthquake. It split the veil. It shook those guys up. They were aware something's going on. He's coming. He goes down. He preaches. He takes him out. And then the massive earthquake at the resurrection. It said a great earthquake. A big one. You know what I think was happening? I think hell enlarged herself. I think that whole thing turned into the bottomless pit. Some interesting facts for you. <clears throat> How can it be a pit and be bottomless? Is it like a tunnel and you keep falling? No, it's like a donut. It wouldn't have a bottom, would it? If it was just round, would it have a bottom? It's a bottomless pit. Now watch this. The circumference of the earth is 25,000 miles all the way around. And that varies just a little bit because it's not perfectly symmetrical, but it doesn't vary a lot. That 25,000 miles rotates every 24 hours. You guys realize this earth, if you were to hover over the earth and just sit there in, in space and just watch, just look straight down at it, it's moving a, thousand, a little over 1,000 miles an hour. You guys realize you're moving 1,000 miles an hour right now? Is that cool or what? I, to me, that's just cool stuff. I've always liked science and math. I mean, I thought it was interesting. That's cool. I mean, no wonder. I, I just... That's why I'm right with God and everybody else that's slow isn't. If you're a fast, hyper person, you're in tune with Mother Earth. She's moving. Now, wait a minute. As you get down towards the middle, that thing probably speeds up. And some of the scientists say that they believe the core of the Earth is moving faster than the Earth is moving. But I still kind of tend to laugh when they say anything. I mean, when they open their mouths, I want to laugh. I don't care if he's got an IQ of 200. I just think... Wow, you're such an idiot. You know, why, do you, why do you say that, preacher? Because the core itself is 1,500 miles in diameter, right? And then once again, they say it's the temperature is close to the temperature of the surface of the sun. That's what they say. I don't know any of them that have ever been there and back, but that's what they say. Does that make you feel better to know that they know? Do you realize that, that in order to get down there, it's a little less than 4,000 miles just to the, just to the core? Do you know the farthest anybody's ever been recorded to have drilled that I could find? Seven and a half miles. They've gone down seven and a half miles, and they're trying to tell you and I what's going on 4,000 miles down? You've never seen it? You've never been able to observe it? Isn't that what they do in science? They observe? You've never observed it. So how do you say there's no hell? How can you say that's impossible? You're a fool in the eyes of God. You're just as dumb as the atheists when you say you believe the Bible, when you say you believe Jesus Christ, but you say there's no hell. Hey, listen, He was there. He saw it. He created it. If He said there's a hell, then there's a hell. That's good enough for me. The rest of them are fools. Pastor Chad, could you grab Psalms 39.5, please? You know what else I find interesting? I find interesting that they say they believe it's made of iron and nickel. An iron-nickel alloy. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. I'm going to show you some stuff about iron in the Bible that will interest you. It's really neat stuff. Really neat stuff. You got it, brother? Could you read it for us? Psalm 39.5 Behold, thou hast made my days as a handbreadth, and my age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best age is altogether vanity. Say a lot. That's it. So when they tell you this, that, and the other thing about the core of the earth, I, I mean, honestly, they're probably right. I realize science is very advanced. I know they can do some amazing things. But honestly, God is going to sit in heaven and laugh. And folks, when we get it, <laughs> when we finally get it, when God finally unrolls back that curtain and lets us see the reality of everything, we're going to go, I can't believe we were so dumb. I would have been a lot better just to study the Bible. I'd have been a lot closer. I'd have known a lot more. Now, back in Revelation chapter number 9. I'm going to ask some of you fellas to help me. Uh, Brother Josh, would you grab Psalm 82, please? Um. Brother Anthony, would you grab Job chapter 2? And then uh, Pastor Chad, would you grab Jude 6? And you're going to read uh, 6 and 13. That's chapter 6 and 13. He smiled. 
I want to read you this. And the rest of you, you can you can turn if you want or you can stay there if you want in Revelation chapter nine. But I want to look at these beasts because I find it interesting that they're locked up. And and God's letting them out in the tribulation period. Now, how many of you have read the Gospels, right? And you've seen all the devils that are there. You've seen in the book of Acts, there's devils that are being cast out and, and all that kind of stuff. But then this shows us that their spirits locked up. So why are some locked up and some are roaming free? Isn't that interesting stuff? First of all, let me say this. Hebrews 9, 5 is right and everything else is wrong. And over it, the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. So when somebody tries to say they got all those answers, they're lying to you. I'll never forget how good I felt when I was in Bible school. I went and I asked uh, Brother Lentz a question about this very subject. I said, how come some are locked up, some are roaming free? Where do those guys come from? Where do those guys come from? And was just trying to, you know, to, to you know, spar a little bit with them, you know, arrogant little punk. And he said, you know, brother, here's what I think. I'm going to call the old man and ask him. So he called the old man and asked him. And he came back and he said, well, the old man wasn't sure. I said, oh, I stumped the old man. I'm quite the scholar. I'm the next Dr. Ruckman. Look out. And everybody doesn't realize it yet, but I'm coming. You know what the honest truth is? Nobody knows. It doesn't make you smart to figure out something nobody can figure out, does it? I mean, you can't figure it out. Because the Bible said you can't speak of some things now particularly. The Bible tells us in Colossians to be careful about intruding into those things which we have not seen vainly puffed up in our fleshly mind. So when you start looking at this stuff and you start making hard and fast and dogmatic statements, you're going to be in a position to get knocked down by God. Because he looks on all that are proud and he abases them. But there's some things I can see here that I'll show you what I think might might be happening. And this is just, be honest with you, guesswork. Because God doesn't lay it out there that clear. And I think he knows why. I think he's right. The reason is because of this. Listen, the Bible talked about the time when there was a dispensation of angels. Some of these verses we're going to read in a minute are going to show you that. When God created the first earth, in the first heaven, he created a bunch of angels and they were perfect. And there was a period of time there where everything was fine. Then Lucifer fell. And God gives us glimpses of what happened, but he doesn't lay it out. You know what he lays out for you and me? What we need to know. We need to know our creation, our fall, our redemption and our future. And that's what God shows us. So to be honest with you, God didn't put all the answers in there for us. We know they're there. That's well enough. I don't like messing around with this stuff too much, folks. It's higher than me. It's more powerful than me. But I do like studying my Bible. So I'm going to have you read some verses here. Psalm 82. Who did I give that to? Go ahead, brother. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty, and judgeth among the gods. How long will you judge judge unjustly, and accept the persons of the wicked they lie? Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy, rid them out of the hands of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. All right, now he said, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Is that a weird statement or what? But you'll die like men. You know what happened? He made them angelic and supernatural, perfect beings. But he said, you're going to die like men. Isn't that weird? Pastor Chad, which one did I give you, brother? Jude, verse 6 and verse 13. Go ahead and grab those. Jude, verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate will bless their own habitation. He hath reserved his everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Verse 13, raging the waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Okay, now listen. It sounds like two different classifications. You've got some reserved in chains. Did you hear that? That was verse 3. 
You've got some that are wandering stars, reserved. they got a reservation in the blackness of darkness. But there's a difference. You know, if you, if you paid attention at all in this church, you know that there's different levels of judgment from God, right? He said that, the, that, 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 that uh, it would be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah the day of judgment than for those cities that heard the preaching and rejected the gospel. So, the Bible talks about burning to the lowest hell. There's different levels of judgment. God's just. And the more light somebody sins against, the more judgment that they get. So, it looks like some of those angels that must have had a closer position to the Lord or a greater status, because we know from studying the Bible that there's a tier of angels. There's a, a tier of their power. There's a tier of their position before the Lord. So, it sounds like those that were closest to the Lord got the worst judgment and they're locked up right now and they can't get out. And there's some wandering and, and we're not going to get into all this tonight, especially since the kids are there, but they're like disembodied spirits and those are the ones always seeking to possess people. They want to be back in a body. Isn't that interesting? They got disembodied and they're left to wander and they're miserable and they want flesh back. Kind of strange stuff. When angels show up in the Bible, I mean holy angels, they show up like a man. You could... You, a lot of times they wouldn't even know it was an angel. So those fallen creatures can do the same thing. You know what's really weird? Science nowadays starts messing around with, uh, with DNA manipulation and with cloning. Do you, do, have you ever stopped and said, what in the world happens when they successfully clone an animal? Because God's the one that gives life. And, and when a person's born, he gives them that spirit. He puts that soul in them. What happens when you clone a beast or if you clone a person? Where do they get the spirit from? What's the soul? Is there a soul? Are they nothing more than a beast? Or are they devils? I, I'm just saying. Guys, don't intrude into things you haven't seen. They up, puffed up in your fleshly mind. I'm just telling you, more's going on than we realize. Paul says, you wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. You know what you've got? You've got to wrestle. You've got to fight. And they're out there. But there's some locked up. And as that tribulation gets rolling and things start getting bad, those things are being released and they've been down there for a long time. And they're coming out with vengeance. You talk about judgment. You talk about pain. You talk about tribulation. You talk about torture. Hitler hasn't figured out torture compared to what those boys are going to bring out. That's a scary thought. And you know what it looks like you see? looks like you see these things cloned. There's a mixture of different types of beasts all in one beast. Strange stuff, man. Job chapter number 2. Um, start in verse number 1, please. I'll stop you when I'm ready. All right, brother, you can stop right there. Thank you. Now, verse number two. The sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan with them. The sons of God. Interesting statement. They're there with Satan. I'll read Job 38, verses 1 through 7. The Lord answered Job out of the world and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the, the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? Now listen. When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. You know what those sons of God are? They're a direct creation of God. And they're fallen. Some of them are fallen. To them gave you power to become 
the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You become a son of God when you believe on the name of Jesus Christ. At that point, you are a direct creation. You're born again. You're born of the Spirit. You are a direct creation of God. Until then, all of mankind except Adam are procreations. You get that? Does that make sense? You're a procreation. But the moment you get born again, you're his direct creation. You become a son of God. So anything God creates directly was the Son of God. When all the sons of God shouted for joy. So some of them fell. That's why he was saying over there in Psalm 82, you're gods, but you'll die like men. Interesting. And now as God brings out judgment on the earth for crucifying Jesus Christ, for torturing Israel, for running from God and denying the Word of God, now when He starts to bring out that judgment, He says, I'm going to let something out on you that's more powerful than you've ever seen in your life. And it's just a phase in my judgment because it's going to get worse. So far, we haven't seen the devil bring it down yet. What a mess, brother. Say, so, preacher, you're really bumming me out. Well, it shouldn't. Because you're saved, aren't you? You're not going to be here. You're going to be gone. I want to show you the five I wills of Satan. I'm going to skip this thing about iron I was going to show you. I want to get to the five I wills of Satan. Go back with me to Isaiah chapter 14, if you would, please. Isaiah chapter 14, because I want to tie this in and leave you on a positive note, and I want to do it quickly. I want to leave you on a note that will be encouraging and a help to you because I know this stuff not all that encouraging. <laughs> I got some pretty strong opinions about some of it that I just really don't, don't feel like uh, it's profitable to teach too much of it. And besides all that, man, who knows? Amen? <laughs> That's heavy. All right, Isaiah 14. Now watch this. Start reading with me in verse number 4 if you would. Thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, Hath the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased? The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke. He that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. Now, wait a minute. Who's ruling the nations? You know we're talking about Lucifer here, right? Who's ruling the nations? So you guys really that depressed when the wrong president gets in? I mean, didn't the Bible tell you who, who was in charge? Who's the God of this world? That's right. Do you, ever, do you remember when he tempted Christ? He brought him up on a high mountain and he said, All the kingdoms of the world bow down and worship me. Hey, I give them to whoever I want to give them to. <laughs> Forgive me this, okay? Forgive me my wrong here. I just sometimes sit back and say, I wonder if our voting even matters at all. If the devil doesn't just sit back there and just play with everything and everybody. I'm not saying don't vote, okay? Next time, go get them, amen? Let's just pray and hope and try. But we prayed and hoped and tried this time, and all we got was hope, not change. Right? Right? I just wonder. I just wonder. Because he says that he ruled the nations. He ruled the nations in anger. You realize he doesn't have your best interest at heart? That's sin. That's any sin, Christian. Any sin, any temptation, any struggle, any rebellion against God. Oh, I'm just afraid if I surrender, God's going to call me to preach and then I'll really be miserable like pastor. (laughs) Hey, listen. Listen, he doesn't have your best interest at heart. So when you rebel against the will of God for the I wills, we're going to look at in a minute, you're always messing up. He's in anger. Now watch verse 7. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. That's when Jesus shows up. They break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Thou art laid down. No feller has come up against us. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. That is one powerful creature. When hell starts to stir up, when hell starts to vibrate, starts to move because it's coming to it, because he's coming to it. That's a beast, boy. Now watch. They, uh, where was I at? Uh, nine. Um, <clears throat> stirreth up the dead for thee. Night of the living dead. What is that? Was that a 70s thing or something? 
Anybody know? You can. I'm not going to blame you. Was that? Isn't that one of the horror movies or something? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Somebody's honest. I don't know who it was. I wasn't looking. I closed my eyes and asked, will you tell me? Listen, all that zombie stuff and the zombie apocalypse and all that stuff, you know what? You know what? They, they don't realize how much they're playing right into prophecy and what's going to happen. Even all the chief ones of the earth. Now, wait a minute. The chief ones of the earth. You think about these guys, you watch these guys on TV, those, those, those Iranians or whoever those people are over there, the, the, those, those Middle Eastern leaders who hate Israel, and they're powerful men, they're political men, they're rich men, and they talk all that war stuff, and they're constantly talking about dying and killing, and the, the thing that we've seen here not too long ago about the Middle East, and, and what it was that they tried, how they brainwashed their children to die and to kill, to, to defeat Israel. A, 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 a real live TV broadcast. They're holding up a beating heart, a fresh beating heart in the streets. Kids all around, regular people all around. They're holding up a fresh bleed, beating heart, still beating in his hand. And that's modern. <laughs> all these leaders of this earth. Guys, we've been so sheltered here in America. We got it so good. We don't even know what's going on around us. All these big shots, all these, uh, all these political leaders, all the chief ones of the earth. You know, he gives the power to whom he will. You just got to wonder sometimes. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. And they all shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave. And the noise of thy vials... The worm is spread under thee, and, wor- and the worms cover thee. I've covered that before, and I'm not going to waste the time right now, but that's interesting stuff. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? Well, America's fallen. America ain't what she used to be. I heard, uh, who is it? Somebody said uh, Rush Limbaugh was talking about it today, and he started off his show with... Uh, We've officially become a nation of gimmies or handouts or something like that. That's exactly right. Where did the work ethic go? Now everybody says, give me from the government. It used to be they say, get out of my way so I can make opportunities. Amen. So I want an opportunity to prove what I can do. Get back, I'm rolling up my sleeves, I'm getting to work. Now it's government... And the whole nation will come out to vote in somebody. Hey, listen, the conservative people that got the old-fashioned values showed out too. And they came out as hard as they could. But they could not overwhelm the gimme generation. They didn't have what it took. He weakens the nations. How is it that our nations become so weak from such a powerful status to what you're seeing today? It's going to get worse. How? This fiscal cliff, one of the first things they cut is the military budget. I heard that. I, I mean, I can say that's a fact. I heard it on the radio. Oh, that's great. That's great. We got a guy in office who's been trying to back off the military and weaken America's stance with everybody around the world where they can attack our embassies and get away with it. Makes me want to join the Marine Corps, but I forgot. I won't be allowed to shoot anybody. So, What a joke, people. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to get mad. Can you tell? I didn't move on. I'm getting mad. All right. It's the devil that weakens the nations. It's his world. He's the God of this world, folks. So don't let it shock you. Now watch verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. Number one. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Number two. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Number three. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Number four. I will be like the most high. Number five. Five is the number of grace. Are you nuts? You can't think that unless you go to a seminary. That's the only way you could ever get that opinion. I'm telling you. You can't get that from a Bible. Five, five is the number of death, brother. It's the number of destruction. So the five I wills of Satan caused him to wind up in verse 15. Yet shalt thou be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. That's where he's going to wind up. Now, the five I wills of Satan. I'm going up. 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 Right? 
God says, all right, buddy, you're going down. He goes down in five steps. He starts out as the anointed cherub that covereth in the third heaven. You find him in Job. He's Leviathan. And he's swimming up there in the deep. And the water's above outer space. as his first emotion. I'm going somewhere with this. I'm going somewhere. It's his first emotion. His second emotion, he goes from being Leviathan to the prince and the power of the air. After Christ died on the cross of Calvary, and he made a show of them openly. I love that phrase. He made a show of them openly. I mean, boy, he took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Jesus Christ, when he, the bulls of Bashan encompassed him about when he was on that cross, there was demons of hell coming after him, trying to get him to sin, trying to get one little sin come out, trying to accentuate his torture, trying to focus on the fact that God had denied him, that sin was on him, and trying to get him just to commit one sin. I don't think there was a demon anywhere in the planet, anywhere in outer space, anywhere, but at the foot of the cross when Jesus Christ was on that thing, trying to put the pressure on him to crack. And he made it show them openly. I just I get the picture of just some kind of a real arrogant punk who you know shows you up in basketball and is like, "What's up, man?" Nothing. I see I see the Lord doing that to the devils. Just like, "Hey, what's up, guys?" <laughs> I didn't even fight yet. I'm gonna fight later. This time I died and I beat you. I mean, I died and I beat you. I beat you from a grave because I came out of it. I'm coming back fighting, but I didn't fighting yet. Is that all you got? That encourages me, man. I'm on the way. You guys are looking at me like I'm crazy. I know I'm weird, but I'm not crazy. He won. He made a show of him openly on the cross. And Satan got another demotion. And now he's the prince in the power of the air. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. That's where he's at. Folks, He's getting more and more angry because he's getting closer and closer to the end. You see, there's another demotion coming. The next demotion is he's when he, in, in chapter number 12 of Revelation. We'll get there in a few weeks. In chapter number 12, he gets kicked to the earth. So no longer is he the prince of the power of the air. Now he's on the earth. Because God's coming in. God's letting him go. God's controlling. Listen to me, especially you kids. You listen to me. When you talk about those things coming up, God controls them. And only lets them go as far as they got to go. That's why when you go to bed at night and you pray for God to protect you and you get up in the morning, you pray for God, you just sleep with peace. Lay your head down, you go to sleep, you don't think about nothing, you don't worry about nothing, you dream beautiful dreams, you girls be a princess and dance around in your little palace and you boys go kill a bunch of Indians and scalp them because you're safe. Jesus has it all under control. And in the tribulation, he's letting it go and letting it go and letting it go while he's controlling it at the same time. And we're all gone. Praise the Lord. But in the meanwhile, the pressure's coming down on him and he's pushing him down closer and closer. He comes out in the tribulation period and he gets to earth. What happens after that? Back in Revelation. Let me get back there real quick. I'm almost done. Just give me a second. Revelation. I know it's Wednesday night, folks. I love you. I appreciate you being here. I know you're tired. I appreciate you coming. Just give me a second. Where's my verse? Revelation. Uh, what am I looking for here? See, now you're putting all this pressure on me, and now I'm getting all lost. No, I'm just kidding. I am looking for Revelation, where he's bound up. I think it's 19. Just go there. I'm pretty sure it's 19. Um, no, verse 20, chapter 20. Here it is. Here's his fourth demotion. Revelation 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. That's going to be a neat thing to see, man. A supernatural chain that can bind the devil. That's going to be cool. You're going to see, you guys realize you're going to see that? You're going to see it. That, that, that is a cool thought. And it's not that far away. I mean, I think he'll come back before I hit 50. 15 years. That adds seven. And, and we're going to be seeing this. You guys, we could be, you guys, we could, we could be seeing this in less than 30 years. Is that a cool thing? Or, I think that's cool, don't you? Do you really want to live to be old and have somebody changing your diaper and some little sticking? You ever see these 20 and 30 year olds that walk in and say, Hi, how are you today? And all that's sitting there, he's going, You stupid little punk. Don't talk to me like I'm a baby. If I could kick you, I would. I'll spank you right now. You ever notice that? You talk to him like that, but you really want that? <laughs> I mean, you're laughing, but I think about it. I'm like, 
I stand back and I'm like, wow, that guy's got to be like, what an idiot. I am not a baby. I'm 95 years old, you know. You want that? Oh, let's get out of here, amen? Let's, let's just have them come back and get us out. My family, I've got to worry about them. They'll be there. I'll be there. It'll be great, man. Praise the Lord. You'll be there? Uh, it'll be all right. All right. Um, <laughs> now watch. Where did I stop? Oh, I stopped at the chain. I got off on the chain. That was just wonderful. I, I was, I, I'm a little rabbit. I'm terrible about that. I know, but it's all right. Verse number two. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should not deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. There's another demotion coming. And we'll study it in detail when we get there, but after that he's released and he goes out. It's an amazing thing. Christ is ruling and reigning on the earth. They're seeing him. And that old Lucifer comes up out of that pit and he goes around and he gets another massive group together and they go to attack the city of God. Who would fall for that? Who in the world would fall? They do by the billions. And then his final demotion. The lake of fire for all eternity. Fivefold I wills, fivefold fall. And he's down and out, brother. And he's out for good. I want to show you this verse. Let's close over here. Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. I was going to show you that thing about iron, but we won't spend the time on it tonight. Iron's a type in the Bible of, uh, of devils, of death. The first time it shows up, it shows up in the book of Genesis chapter 4. The guy's name is Tubal Cain, and it actually means son of Cain. And he was a, a, an artifactor. He would he would work on, on on iron and brass and all that stuff in Genesis four. Second time the word shows up is in Leviticus twenty six. God says, "I'll make your heavens iron." And it's funny how that thing all the way through the Bible. Who was a murderer from the beginning? The devil, right? Who's the first murderer in the Bible? Cain. The Bible tells you in Peter he was of that wicked one. Weird. So Tubal Cain is the guy's name. The who who was a artifactor in iron and that was Genesis chapter 4 by Genesis chapter 6 there's so much blood on the planet that God says I'm going to drown them now listen you know he must have been making things for war things to kill with because Cain is a murderer he's the son of Cain that's what they named him he must have been a stinking murderer and he was inventing weapons of war because by the time you get to Genesis 6 God says my spirit's not always striving with man there's a bloody bloody nasty bunch of people I'm done with them isn't that interesting? So iron all the way through your Bible is a negative thing for the most part. Now, those beasts have iron breastplates in, Genesis, in Revelation 4 we were looking at. Watch this. Isaiah 2, verse 1. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. And all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, come and let us go up into the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob. And he shall teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares shares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. It doesn't come from the United Nations. Sorry. It comes from Jesus Christ. Look at look at Isaiah eleven. We'll read verses one to nine and we'll close out. Isaiah chapter eleven, start reading in verse number one with me, if you would. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he shall make him a quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge the sight of the, after the sight of the eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of the ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. <laughs> wow. Wow. Why are you showing us that, preacher? 
Because I'm trying to rewind you to the end. I don't think it's good to leave on a note of demons and devils coming up on it. I think you need to see what's going to happen. That's encouraging in my heart. And the righteous shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Uh, righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins. And the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them, and the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the ass. And the weaned child shall put his hand in the cockatrice den. And they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You know what it said over there in Isaiah 14 about the devil? We never got to him. It said the way he treated thy people. The devil don't treat his people very good. And as he's in charge and as he's running the earth and as he's got control over principalities and powers and he's got control over kingdoms and you're in his world, in the world you shall have tribulation, Jesus said, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Folks, this ain't my home and this ain't where it ends. It's going to end in his holy mountain. And the beasts aren't going to be coming up out of the pit attacking people. The little kid's going to stick your hand down in there and he's going to grab that very poisonous asp and he's going to pull him out. He's going to say, hey, and that asp's going to lick your kid's head and wrap around that arm all sweet and gentle-like and she's going to walk by that lion and she's going to say, how you doing? You do good. And he's going to roll over. She's going to scratch his belly. That's when Jesus is in control. And I'm glad he's in here. My message to you tonight is this. How's your will compared to his will? It was Satan's I wills that got him in trouble. But it was never the will of Jesus Christ that ever got somebody who's born again and loves him and who has him in their heart. Jesus' will will never get you in trouble. There's a difference between surrender and submission. I encourage you to be submissive. I surrender all. That's good and everything. But really, do you really want surrender? Do you know what that word means? It means I fought to the bitter end and I can't fight anymore. So fine, I surrender. Submission says, I have a will. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we love you and we thank you so much for Jesus Christ. I had a wonderful king. And Father, I'm looking forward to the day when he comes back and rules and reigns on this earth and we get to rule and reign with him. Lord, I just get excited about it. My heart gets warm. I just get stirred up like a kid at Christmas. Lord, I feel like I have butterflies in my stomach. It's just so nice. It's so wonderful. And I pray the day comes soon, Lord. In the meanwhile, Father, we're here on this earth. We know who the God of this world is and we know who our God is. And we know Jesus said, Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And you promised that you'd protect us, you'd take care of us. We thank you for that. And Father, I pray you to help us to be faithful. Help us to do something about the people around us who are dying and going to hell. Help us, Lord, to love one another, to grow in the Word of God, to be more like Jesus Christ every day of our lives. And Father, I pray that you'd help us to surrender, to submit our will to yours. Not to be like the devil and resist and fight and chafe and And just be vile to the bitter end. But help us, Father, to be like Jesus Christ and say, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. We love you, Lord. Encourage our hearts tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.